It still wasn't a sure thing that we were going to win the war in the autumn of 1943. It was a very dark time in American history and also a very interesting time for professional football. You know, the the NFL barely survived World War II. And uh, part of the reason really was because of the Steagles and uh, and being able to keep a franchise alive and, and keep the league alive. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Thank you, professional announcer guy, as always. Hi, I'm Tim Hanlon. I am the host, the curator of this here little podcast we call Good Seats Still Available. Thank you for joining me. Uh, This is the podcast, as you know, that we explore what used to be in professional sports. Today, my uh, guest is Matthew Algio. Uh, who is the author of uh, a wonderful book about a team that existed in 1943 and is a forgotten footnote in pro football sports history, uh, but one uh, very worth telling, and you're going to hear why in a minute. Matthew's book is called Last Team Standing, How the Steelers and the Eagles, the Steagles, Saved Pro Football During World War II. Uh, It's a fascinating conversation. It's an even more fascinating story. Uh, and Matthew's got a whole bunch of uh, of anecdotes and, and interesting tidbits uh, in the process of writing this book and uh, the story behind it. Before we get to the conversation, uh, I do want to remind everybody, please go to goodseatsstillavailable.com. You'll find out what's going on with this wacky little show and find out uh, just exactly how to follow and uh, learn more about uh, all the things that we're doing. Uh, social media, we are on Twitter at goodseatsstill. Uh, we're on Facebook uh, as well. You'll find a page for Good Seats Still Available there. Uh, we're also on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. You can also send us email and all that kind of stuff at the website. And you can subscribe to us just about wherever good podcasts are found. Uh, that's clearly iTunes, uh, Stitcher, uh, TuneIn. Uh, you can grab the RSS feeds. Uh, they're all out there. Wherever you get us, though, uh, we uh, do appreciate your comments, your inquiries, your uh, curiosities, and of course, your ratings and reviews. Uh, Please, if you like the show, uh, please, by all means, do so. Uh, If you don't like the show, just send me an email. and We'll try to figure out why, but uh, you don't have to put that online. And uh, we thank you for your great support thus far. All right, let's waste no more time. Let's get to uh, Matthew Algio. He is the author of Last Team Standing, How the Steelers and the Eagles, the Steagles, Saved Pro Football During World War II. And again, if you are a uh, a Philadelphia Eagles fan today, if you are a Pittsburgh Steelers fan today, uh, and you don't know the story about the Steagles, uh, give a listen because you're going to learn a lot as I did. Thank you. And I guess uh, one great way to start with our listeners uh, is even though our listeners may think that you sound like you're next door, Mm -hmm. uh, you're actually not. You want to tell our listeners where you're, you're calling in from? I am in the capital of Mozambique, which I'm sure all your listeners know is Maputo. Uh, And uh, I am here because my wife is a U.S. Foreign Service officer and she worked at the U.S. Embassy here. She's the public affairs officer uh, at the embassy here in Maputo. And uh, we've been here about two years and uh, we'll be leaving in just a few weeks, actually, in uh, early June. So uh, I, uh, I guess I'm probably your first guest from well, it, it, that's fascinating, and, and it just shows hopefully our fledgling little podcast listenership group uh, just the extent, but uh, the extent by which we will uh, reach out and, and continue to uh, pursue our our uh, perverse obsession with uh, teams and leagues and and those kinds of stories that don't exist anymore. So I thank you for well, you yes, you have a global reach already, <laughs> which is uh, just fantastic. So tell your friends in in the. Uh, on the peninsula there. We, uh, we appreciate it. Um, so, uh, Matthew, why don't you just, uh, maybe the best place to start is at the start. How did you first come across this, uh, the team story of the Steagles? What attracted you to it, uh, and, and convinced you that it was a story worth writing about? Yeah, I, uh, I'm originally from the Philadelphia area, so I kind of always knew, I, and I, I, I grew up a big Eagles fan, uh, and I always knew uh, about the Steagles, you know, kind of as the answer to a trivia question uh, during the war, the Eagles, the Steelers merged. And uh, I, I really didn't think much more about it until 2003. And in 2003, the uh, Steelers uh, in a preseason game with the 
uh, Eagles, Eagles Steelers preseason game in Pittsburgh, they had a, a ceremony to mark the 60th anniversary of the Steagles. And at the time, I was a public radio reporter. I was uh, in Maine. I worked at Maine Public Radio, but I also freelanced for NPR programs. And there's an NPR program called Only a Game. And I pitched the story to them. I thought it'd be cool to uh, go to this uh, preseason game where the Steagles would be commemorated and interview some of the old players and uh, and do a story about it. And uh, they agreed. So I went to Pittsburgh and uh it was it was neat. I uh, I got to stand on the sidelines during the game, and they came out at halftime. And uh, uh, after the game, I was able to interview. I think six of the Steagles were there in 2003, and uh, I did the story for only a game, and uh, really thought that there might be something longer uh, uh, worth doing, a, a longer story. And uh, I um, had an agent, a literary agent. I still have. And I told her the idea and she thought it was kind of cool. And uh, so we uh, put together a proposal and sent it out to publishers and uh, DeCapo Press uh, uh, bought the idea. And so I was able then to uh, spend about a year doing uh, a lot more research on the project and going back and interviewing the players again and a couple of the players who weren't in Pittsburgh. And uh, at the end of that process, I, I had this book. How, though, um, did you sort of stumble uh, sort of into the sort of rich history? Because, frankly, it, it feels like without some longer treatment like you've done in, in your book, um, you know, it was almost sort of an asterisk or a footnote uh, in mm -hmm. the history of, of two of the legacy teams of the NFL, the, the Steelers and the Eagles. Yeah, well, uh, what, as I began to do the research for the book proposal and then for the book itself, I, I think what really – fascinated me was uh, the the larger context, which was life on the home front during World War II. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm 50 years old. This is all well before I was born, but really in my parents' lifetime, my dad was a World War II vet. And uh, I'd never really thought much about what life was really like day-to-day -day life uh, on the home front. And uh, another aspect of it was researching uh, uh, the draft and how the military draft worked and how did it come to be that these guys could play NFL football uh, when we needed so many uh, young men for the military and uh, doing research about uh, the deferments for the draft. A lot of these guys were uh, not physically able to uh, be in the military, but still could play in the NFL. And so I, I think like kind of going beyond just the, 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 as you put it, the asterisk that the Steagles were and, and looking at the larger context of uh, of the times in America uh, in the middle of World War Two. You know, it still wasn't a sure thing that we were going to win the war in the autumn of 1943. It was a very dark time in American history and also a very interesting time for professional football. You know, the the NFL barely survived World War Two. And uh, part of the reason really was because of the Steagles and uh, and being able to keep, uh, uh, you know, keep a franchise alive and, and keep the league alive. And so I found a lot of material also beyond the Steagles about uh, the rest of the NFL and really all of professional sports during World War Two. So I really found it to be a fascinating time in American history. And I think so, Penny, you know, when we talk about that time, we're so uh, really preoccupied with the war uh, as well. We should be. But, uh, you know, there was a whole other story going on. Uh, here at home in the United States at that time. And, uh, and I think I, um, I, I found that to be uh, um, a really fascinating part of the Steagles story. Well, the Steagles themselves were uh, part of the 1943 NFL uh, season, but perhaps uh, you can enlighten our listeners a bit into sort of uh, the prelude uh, to that uh, situation, maybe a couple of years prior, uh, obviously the U S yeah. and it's, it's, Participation in the war was not necessarily solidified in 39 or 40, but um, but obviously there were some things that sort of preceded the Steagles coming into being. And perhaps you can maybe set the stage a bit. Yeah, well, uh, I, I think uh, the most interesting place to start is December 7th, 1941, which, of course, is the day that the uh, Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and uh, it was a Sunday and happened to be the last day of the NFL regular season. So a lot of people learned that uh, 
the uh, Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor and that the uh, United States was entering World War II uh, by listening to a football game or maybe even were at the stadium. Uh, the Eagles were playing the Redskins in Washington that Sunday, and uh, a lot of uh, service members were at the game. One of them was a young uh, Navy officer, John F. Kennedy. Uh, and of course, there were a lot of bigwigs uh, at, at the uh, at the game in Washington. And as the game proceeded, more and more of them were paged to go back to their office. And uh, Sammy Ball talked about how he'd never heard so many pages during a game. And everybody wondered what the hell was going on. But the players had no idea. Uh, of course, uh, the people listening on the radio and a lot of people at the ballpark knew uh, what had happened. But the players on the field had no idea. And uh, the stadium was half empty by the time the game ended and they just wondered what had happened and it wasn't until they got back to the locker rooms that uh, they found out that the United States was uh, really in all likelihood going to war. 1942 then was the first full season uh, that the NFL played during the war and uh, uh, they were really able to make a go of things uh, mainly because they really hadn't ramped up the draft uh, uh, the way it would ramp up in 1943 and 1944. Fathers were still exempt, for one thing, and uh, a lot of the, especially a lot of the better teams, like the Bears uh, and the Giants, had a lot of fathers on the team, and so they didn't lose as many players. Uh, it really was in 1943 uh, that the draft uh, 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 really started to increase. And I talk in the book, one of the interesting things researching uh, I say, uh, if truth is the first casualty in war, then the, the second casualty is the uh, physical re requirements for men to be inducted into the army. Because at the beginning of the war, the, the uh, requirements were very stringent. About 40 percent of, of uh, men who were inducted in, uh, in 1940 uh, were rejected as unfit for military service. But as the war progressed, the standards progressively got lower and lower. And uh, more and more men were accepted uh, as fit for service. And so the NFL, by 1943, was really freight facing a critical manpower shortage. In the summer of 43, the Steelers only had six players under contract. And the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers, who were a football team, an NFL team at the time, the owners weren't very imaginative about uh, about names, really. Uh, but the Dodgers uh, had zero players under contract at one point in the summer of 43. So it became very apparent to the NFL that they were going to have to do something uh, drastic to keep the league alive. Um, I especially uh, uh, love uh, in the beginning of your book, which, uh, as our listeners already know, but we'll plug away again uh, early and often is last team standing how the Steelers and Eagles saved pro football during World War II, obviously called the Steagles. Uh, the, the fascinating part uh, that you start the book off with is the roster of the team. Uh, they're not mm -hmm. only their positions and their and their uh, their other vitals, but their draft status that got them basically uh, chosen for the team, uh, which were obviously very low rankings, which I thought was just a, a tremendous scene setter for uh, the issues of whether they were choosing or whether they were actually going to go to war or not. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks. I, I did a lot of uh, a lot of research to find out the uh, the draft status of all the uh, of all the Steagles. A lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the newspapers, the Philadelphia and the Pittsburgh papers at the time would mention uh, somebody's draft status uh, as an aside while uh, reporting on a game. And so I was able to get the draft status of a, a lot of the players uh, from the newspaper, but some uh, I um, actually made requests. Uh, um, you can request uh, uh, service records and uh, draft um, uh, draft records uh, from the government. And so I was able to get a lot of the players uh, draft status through that and also through interviews uh, with the surviving players. And uh, and uh, they helped fill in a lot of the blanks. It's a. Uh, it was really one of the most interesting parts about researching the book was how the draft worked. Um, you know, there was a draft lottery where they just picked a, a, a number out of a out of a big barrel and everybody who was born on that particular date was uh, was drafted. And then they just went down through all the dates and all the numbers and uh, and uh, and it was all judged by your birthday. Uh, so if you got a low number, you were likely to likely to be inducted number you were less likely and uh so it was that the steagles had a lot of players who were 4f that was the designation for somebody who was not physically uh fit for military service but in many cases you could still play football perfectly uh, perfectly fine for example uh, a player with a perforated eardrum 
uh, would not be eligible for military service, but could could play NFL football. And so uh, really a lot of it hinged on what a player's draft status was as to whether or not they'd be playing uh, pro football or being in the army overseas. So that didn't necessarily come with guilt-free feeling, right? It seems like they were certainly no. weighing on not only the players, but perhaps even some of the fans, you know, while the world's at war and the United States is a major sacrifice and and people are basically sending, you know, b- b- putting their lives on the line to help defend the country. You've got this seemingly frivolous exercise called football, uh, and these folks are basically allowed to play it. So uh, there's a little story about uh, Bill Hewitt in there. Maybe that's uh, an example, perhaps. Yeah, um, and and there were several example examples, and I uh, asked the Steagles when I spoke with them about this. Uh, there were a lot of conflicting feelings, uh, both among the players and and among the fans. Uh, the Steagles uh, were the only team in the NFL at the time that required their players to all work in defense jobs during the week, and then. Uh, play football on uh, on Sunday. So the Steagles players were all contributing to the war effort fairly directly. They were working at aviation factories, uh, shipyards. Uh, Ted Doyle, who played on the team, he was uh, um, he was working at the Westinghouse factory in Pittsburgh. He later learned he was helping uh, helping uh, build equipment that uh, ur- enriched uranium for the nuclear bombs, and so in, in some way that in some ways that really kind of mitigated the the feelings of guilt I think that a lot of the players had. Uh, still, uh, you couldn't help but uh, but feel a little guilty at uh, being able to play what what you're right this frivolous thing called football. At the same time that all your friends from college had gone off to war and gone overseas, and a lot of the other players in the NFL, some 600 NFL players. Uh, served in in uh, World War II, and uh, I think uh, 14, 15 of them died in service. Um, so yeah, there was guilt on the part of the players, and uh, at the same time, the fans uh, also wondered why these big husky guys uh, weren't overseas fighting for their country, and uh, there was some abuse uh, hurled at the players. Uh, you mentioned Bill Hewitt. He was an interesting guy. He had played in the NFL uh, uh, back in the in the 1930s. And uh, he had actually retired, and the Eagles brought him out of retirement. He had never worn a helmet before. That's how long it had been since uh, since uh, Bill Hewitt had played. And uh, when he came to the Steagles, he uh, was required to wear a helmet for the first time. I think he was about 35 years old at the time. Um, he was exempt from military service. I believe he was a father uh, at the time. He was also a uh, little on the old side. Um, and so uh, uh, he came back to play for the Steagles and uh, actually didn't play very well. He had been a great, one of the great NFL players. I think he's in the Hall of Fame now, but uh, he was past his prime. But these were the kinds of players that the NFL really depended on. Uh, old guys who came out of retirement, young guys who couldn't, uh, couldn't serve in the military. And uh, it's really how the NFL got by during the war. Well, so playing NFL football was obviously deemed not a frivolous exercise. In fact, you had the president of the United States, FDR, touting baseball, for example, as a, uh, a needed distraction, I think was the quote from your book. Uh, mm-hmm. And You know, I know the NFL was certainly not anything what it is today in terms of stature and grandiosity, but uh, I suspect that the owners of the NFL, uh, in particular a certain owner, which we could probably now segue into, um, believe that football as a distraction was something of somewhat of of a a solve, if you will, for uh, the nation's tensions. Yes, uh, you're right. The NFL in 1943 was not quite the institution it is today. Uh, and it was a very, very distant, I don't even know if you would say second to Major League Baseball. College football was actually much more popular than NFL football uh, in the mid-1940s. Uh, but the owners did feel that uh, there was something uh, something to be gained by uh, uh, keeping the game alive during the war. And not just for their own financial gain. In fact, the war years were not very lucrative financially for most of the owners of the NFL teams. And uh, one owner in particular who uh, was eager to keep the game going was uh, Art Rooney, who was the owner of the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. 
1943. In fact, he was the owner since the team was founded 10 years earlier in 1933. And in 1942, the Steelers had had their best season ever. They had their first winning record. And so uh, Art Rooney was uh, uh, really eager to uh, to keep the team going in 1943. He, he wanted to give the fans something. Uh, they'd had this great season in 1942. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, by the summer of 43, they only had about six players under contract. And so Rooney had to come up with a plan B. And uh, that was when he approached uh, Lex Thompson, who was the owner of the Eagles, and suggested uh, merging uh, the Steelers and the Eagles. And uh, Lex Thompson wasn't exactly thrilled with the idea, uh, but eventually he uh, he agreed. He actually owed Rooney a favor. He had helped uh, help Thompson uh, take control of the uh, of the Eagles uh, a couple years before. And, and so uh, this is how it came to be that uh, uh, the owner of the of the uh, Steelers, uh, Art Rooney, who actually owned the team with Burt Bell. Uh, uh, they were co-owners. Uh, they came to team up with uh, Lex Thompson and uh, formed the Steagles. Well, the, so when that sort of happened, um, it seems like it also didn't come together very easily. I, I you, you spend some time talking about the uh, the battle of the of the two legacy coaches of both the Eagles and the Steelers, and it's um, obviously not easy to get um, them to basically work with each other, having basically been yeah. competitors prior. Yeah. Uh, well, the first the first roadblock was getting the rest of the teams to approve this merger. So uh, what had happened in the in the summer of 43 between the 42 and 43 seasons was uh, the NFL had uh, had been 12 teams uh, and then the uh, Cleveland Rams uh, had to suspend operations in the summer of 43. I think they had two owners who were both serving overseas at the time in the military. And so there was really nobody left to run the Rams. And so they had to suspend operations and that uh, that reduced uh, the uh, the league to nine teams. Uh, I'm sorry, there were originally 10 teams. Uh, the Rams suspend operation. It goes down to nine teams. And that's really not a, a very convenient uh, number for scheduling. And there still was a shortage of players. And so it was decided that two teams should merge. And the best candidates really for merging uh, in 1943 would have been the two teams in Chicago, the Bears and the Cardinals who played in Chicago at that time. But the Bears were defending champions and uh, the rest of the rest of the owners didn't think it was very fair for them to just skim off the best players on the Cardinals. And so uh, that was uh, that was uh, uh, denied that uh, petition to merge the two Chicago teams. And so it came up then. Uh, for the two Pennsylvania teams to merge. And uh, again, there was a lot of uh, discussion about whether this was uh, fair or not, since the Steelers had been so good in 42, but it passed uh, by a vote of five to four, and uh, it was approved for the Steelers and the Eagles to merge. And then when you had training camp, uh, you suddenly had these two teams that had been bitter foes the year before, now united. And this caused some problems. There was an informal agreement that a certain number of uh, Steelers would be in the starting lineup. And so you had a guy like um, uh, uh, Ray Graves had been the starting center for the Eagles in 1942. And he came to training camp in uh, 43. And then suddenly he was second string behind the uh, Steelers center. So there was a lot of dissension among the players at the beginning. And then, of course, mostly, as you alluded to, uh, was the tension between the coaches. What they did is they named the Steelers head coach, Walt Kiesling, and the Eagles head coach, Greasy Neal, co-head coaches. And that went over about as well as you would expect it to go over today. And uh, it was a terrible arrangement. These two guys uh, didn't like each other, for one thing. They had completely different philosophies on coaching for another. Walt Kiesling was an old school, uh, three yards and a cloud of dust guy. Uh, 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 Greasy Neal was a a big proponent of the newfangled T formation uh, that Hallis had instituted in Chicago. And so uh, there was a a lot of tension uh, among the players and the coaches on the Steagles uh, in training camp and uh, as the season began. Um, it seems like there was a, uh, 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 while I guess uh, uh, set up to be a somewhat "quote unquote" merger of equals, uh, I guess a mm-hmm. mo- I guess a modern day example would be the attempted uh, merger of equals between United Airlines and, and Continental, uh, where it seems like they're trying to do one piece from each team to sort of keep it somewhat equitable. It does seem though that despite Art Rooney and the Steelers being sort of the 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 originators of this idea, I guess by default, uh, it almost feels like the Eagles sort of had a little bit of an advantage in terms of 
I guess the colors that were used and and and, and yeah. some of the other things. No, uh, home home game numbers. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, Rooney and uh, his partner Bert Bell did not come uh, come into these negotiations from a very advantageous position. I mean, uh, the Steelers had so few players under contract, they, they had no leverage. Uh, the Eagles had 16 players under contract, uh, uh, which wasn't enough, but of course enough to at least field the team. And so uh, Lex Thompson, the Eagles owner, and he Lex Lex was a different kind of guy uh, uh, among NFL owners at the time. You know, at the time, a lot of NFL owners would just name their team after the after the baseball team in town. And we mentioned the Brooklyn Dodgers. The original name of the Pittsburgh Steelers was the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, the Redskins were the Redskins because in uh, Boston, they, uh, uh, the baseball team was the Braves. Um, so these weren't very uh, uh, original thinking guys a lot of the time, and they didn't understand marketing. Well, Lex Thompson, uh, he sold a brand of eye drops and uh, sold a million bottles of these eye drops a year. So he knew a thing or two about marketing. So when they began no negotiating the nitty gritty of the merger, um, uh, Lex was very protective of the Eagles brand. And so he, uh, he, he basically dictated the terms. And uh, among the terms were that the team would wear green and white uniforms for all games. Uh, the only year that the Steelers have not worn uh, the black and gold was 1943 when uh, uh, the Steagles wore the Eagles green and white uniforms. Uh, there were six home games in 1943. Four of the home games were in Philadelphia, only two home games at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh. Um, so uh, a lot of the fans in Pittsburgh ended up feeling like this really wasn't a Pittsburgh team at all. Uh, you know, they weren't wearing the Steelers colors. They were only playing two home games. And so uh, Rooney and Bell, as the Steelers owners, really had to work hard to drum up support and enthusiasm for the uh, for the merger. But you know, like I said, uh, uh, Rudy had had no choice. He he pretty much was at Lex Thompson's mercy when it came to accepting the terms of the merger. Now, what was the actual name of the team? Because I think it sounds to me that that Steagles was kind of a, a nickname that maybe wasn't even the official name and, and was sort of adopted. What, as the season went on or maybe even in hindsight? Right. Um, uh, yeah, this was another thing. Uh, at first, Lex Thompson insisted the team be known as the Philadelphia Eagles. And uh, this did not go over very well. And even the league, I think, thought this was not a great idea. So uh, at first, they decided to call the team just the Eagles with uh, no city designation. Um, what what it, they ended up being known officially as uh, the, the Philadelphia Pittsburgh Combine. Uh, which doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. And it was inevitable uh, and also hard to fit Philadelphia Pittsburgh Combine into a headline. And so the newspapers really, I, I think it was four days after the merger was announced, uh, the, one of the Pittsburgh newspapers began calling the team the Steagles. Uh, there were other nicknames that were put up, put around, uh, Phil Pitt, uh, Steaglers uh, was another one. But really, Steagles was the one name that really seemed to stick. And uh, and by the first week of the season, even the New York Times was referring to the team as the Steagles, although officially the NFL uh, uh, still uh, calls the team Phil Pitt uh, is how the team is listed in the record books. And uh, when I was researching the book, the NFL still had not even trademarked, uh, registered the name Steagles. Uh, as a trademark, which is kind of amazing considering how protective the NFL is of all its properties. And so uh, the NFL never really acknowledged the name Steagles, although all the fans and all the newspapers did. And so uh, it's kind of an interesting, uh, what's the word, etymology? What's the word for when you figure out how a word began? Um, but it's interesting uh, how, how the Steagles came to be known as the Steagles, yeah. Um well, let's talk about the team. Uh, how did they do? It seems mm -hmm. like they more they basically held their own quite well, despite all the, uh, you know, uh, tenuous circumstances. huh? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't want to give away too much. Uh, you got to buy the book to find out. By the, how way, it all by the way, folks, out. the book again uh, is Last Team Standing, <laughs> How the Steelers yeah. and the Eagles, the Steagles, saved pro football during World War Two. And uh, you'll be able to find that on our website, of course. And um uh, and wherever fine books are sold, but uh, uh, make no mistake, Matthew, we uh, we encourage our listeners to to learn more. No doubt, they could also just Google Steagles and find out. Uh, the the uh, the Steagles actually finished with a record of five four and one, um, which was the first winning season that uh, the uh, Philadelphia Eagles 
Colts franchise had ever had and only the second winning season that the Steelers had ever had. So they really uh, exceeded all expectations. They, If they won their final game against the Packers in Philadelphia at Scheib Park, uh, they actually would have finished in a three-way tie for first place in the uh, in the Eastern Division. Um, so they, they, they fell just a, a game short of actually uh, uh, making a, the playoffs. There would have been a playoff uh, for first place. Um, and, and so it was really kind of a, a, a magical season in a way. Um, uh, they opened the season with a, with a game in Brooklyn against the Dodgers and, uh, and, uh, finished the, finished the game holding the, um, holding the Dodgers. Actually, I'm sorry. The game was actually in Philadelphia. That first game, uh, they held the Dodgers, uh, to minus 33 yards rushing, which I think is still the third best, uh, single game defensive, uh, uh, performance in NFL history. Uh, they, um, they tied, they played the Redskins twice and the Redskins were a powerhouse. They tied them in Philadelphia and then actually beat them uh, second to last week of the season in Washington, uh, which was a phenomenal upset and uh, a very gratifying day for uh, uh, the Eagles uh, uh, quarterback, Roy Zimmerman, who was a cast off from the, from the Redskins. And so uh, as, as the season progressed as well, they got uh, bigger and bigger crowds they started out the season with about a crowd of 11,000 in Philadelphia and then the final game of the season against the Packers uh, was the uh, was a sellout 34,000 at Old Shy Park in Philadelphia so uh, really from a from a, a standpoint of the, the, the success on the field and uh, success off the field at the box office uh, they exceeded all expectations well, you also had some very interesting legacies that came out of that team I mean you mentioned um uh, Ray Graves earlier, he indeed uh, made it uh, to the Pro Football Hall of Fame uh, in 1971. Obviously, a bit past his uh, his previous prime by coming into the into the team, but obviously uh, somebody of, of of great note and lore uh, in the NFL's mm-hmm. uh, history. But uh, you had some. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, Ray Graves before. Um, I mean, Ray Graves. Um, based on my research, and we go to great lengths, Matthew, to uh, to entertain mm-hmm. and educate our audience. Um, was basically in the mix in the University of Florida football program and was the guy who green lighted or green lit, whatever the term is, uh, the uh, test and then ultimate uh, um, follow through of Gatorade uh, for his yeah. thirsty yeah. Uh, team, right? Yeah, he was uh, the the uh, head coach at uh, University of Florida and then um, – uh, he was athletic director for a long time after that as well. And, uh, yeah, Ray, uh, there were some uh, researchers uh, working on um, products to combat dehydration. And they asked uh, Ray if they could use some of the some of the Florida Gators players as guinea pigs for uh, researching this product, which later came to be known as Gatorade. And uh, I believe the University of Florida still receives uh, royalties for uh, for Gatorade uh, for the name. Uh, Ray, I interviewed him and uh, he uh, he was quick to point out, though, that he personally never never got any royalties for Gatorade. Unfortunately, well, it's unfortunate, but he did, he did uh, give him the opportunity to do so. And that's a, it's a it's not only a footnote, it's a, it's a significant forenote, I guess, in the in the history, not only of the NFL, but of, of pro sports in general. And then you also had, you know, uh, having grown up in the New York metropolitan area myself, uh, people know uh, Ali Sherman, uh, mostly from yeah. his New York Giants days. But uh, he went on to be, you know, quite a, uh, a successful sports uh, executive, even to the interest of myself and, and our listeners, uh, part of the uh, New York Cosmos soccer team back in the 1970s and early 80s in the NASL. Uh, including a strong relationship with Pele and his final game and all that kind of stuff. So he too was on the team and, and, and quite revered in his football days uh, afterwards. Yeah, he was a, he was a, a, a short guy, not a not a big guy at all. And uh, I think I have him here in the book, 5'10", 160, played quarterback. And uh, he had a perforated eardrum, uh, which is why he was not fit for military service. Uh, perforated eardrum, if um, uh, if uh, there is a, a, a nerve gas or some kind of poisonous gas attack on the battlefield, uh, uh, perforated eardrum, the, the gas could obviously it would it would be very, uh, uh, very deadly. 
Uh, so you, that's why perforated people with perforated eardrums were rejected for military service. Um, not a the, not the biggest guy, not the strongest guy, but a really really knowledgeable football guy, and uh, he he sort of was taken under um, uh, Greasy Neal's wing. Greasy was the head coach of the Eagles, and uh, and and really sort of learned at uh, Greasy's knee. And uh, as you mentioned, went on to become head coach. I think uh, the Giants won three consecutive uh, NFL Eastern Conference championships in the early 60s. But I guess it was the, you know, um, uh, uh, Vince Lombardi's uh, Packers were so dominant then. Uh, and later, I think uh, Ali was in a group that was trying to buy the New York Jets. Uh, Ali, I think, had a fairly uh, good uh, post football career uh, in finance. And, 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 uh, and I believe that's when that process, that that pursuit is when he met um, a young mm -hmm. and aspirant Steve Ross, then the chairman of Warner Communications or becoming such. And that I think the the loss of that NFL pursuit was what spurred um, Ross yep, on to getting uh, an NF NASL franchise and trying to basically get this pro sports thing, but without having to being able to, to get into the NFL club, so to speak. And uh, Donald Trump, for example, would have done the same thing in the early 80s with the USFL. Again, we digress, right. but uh, it's an interesting uh, seed of, 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 of other sports stuff to come afterwards. Well, it was, it was really interesting to, uh, you know, to see what happened to these guys. Uh, some of them went on to have very long and distinguished NFL careers. Um, Al Wistert, who was one of my favorite guys to interview, he was a rookie in 1943. He'd played at Michigan, uh, broke his, um, broke his wrist while he was playing at Michigan, uh, at Michigan. He was a tackle, uh, broke his wrist playing at Michigan and, uh, and, uh, they detected, uh, osteomyelitis in his x-rays at his, uh, when he was drafted and that's a bone disease. It's an infection and, uh, can, it can be fatal. And, uh, so he was rejected for military service, went on to have a long career with the Eagles. He was captain of the two championship teams in 48 and 49. And a lot of people think he should be in the pro football hall of fame. Uh, and he was actually the very last of the Steagles to pass away. Uh, I think two or three years ago, Al passed away. So none of the Steagles are around. But all these guys, uh, Ernie Steele, another guy I love, halfback. He uh, he he retired to Seattle and uh, and uh, opened up a a, a bar. Uh, a cocktail lounge, as they call them in Seattle at the time, uh, up on Capitol Hill in Seattle, and it became a favorite hangout of the grunge scene in the 90s, uh, Ernie Steele's. And uh, as mentioned, actually, in a song by the band, the uh, Presidents of the United States of America. Um, so, yeah, it was really uh, it was really interesting to see how these guys lives uh, played out even long after the Steagles. So when you interviewed them and, and, and met them during the reunion and all that, um, uh, what were the, the was there a a uniform kind of reaction to sort of the memories? I mean, were they mostly happy ones? Were they uh, wistful? Uh, were they, you know, random? Uh, what was the feeling? Was it, were they happy to be back together again? Was there any sort of camaraderie? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Um, and I think, you know, especially after 60 years, any of the old animosities had long since faded. I, you know, I think it would be any, it was like any kind of reunion for them. Um, I think when I interviewed them uh, at at the uh, at the stadium in Pittsburgh, I just blanked on it. What is it, Heinz Field? Correct. Um, yeah, uh, at at Heinz Field, um, you know, it was sort of a, a kind of a rushed thing. Uh, backstage uh, kind of got stock answers. It was really when I was uh, I followed up and uh, went to visit them, most of them in their homes, and uh, was able to really sit and talk you know, for an hour, even a couple hours, um, that, uh, you really sort of peeled back the, the stock answers and, 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 and were able to get to what it really felt like at the time. Like I mentioned, there was some animosity, especially at the beginning of the season, there was a, a competition between the Steelers and the Eagles and uh, each team was really loyal to its own head coach and there was the tension between the coaches. And so I, I was really happy. I think I got some really honest, uh, you know, answers, not just, a you know, the usual, uh, anecdotes, uh, uh, that I'm sure they've, they've, they've repeated a uh, hundred times, but, um, but, but really, so uh, to answer your question, it was a whole range. Um, I think people did remember the animosity, but they looked back at the time very fondly. Um, they were all very proud of the, the, the role they played and having played in the, in the national football league. And, uh, 
And uh, they all had very strong opinions about what football is like today. So uh, it was a lot of fun talking to these guys. Do you think there's a movie in here somewhere? I'm, I'm sure you've thought about optioning or, or it's not, you know, it certainly crossed your mind. But um, it feels like this is a great story that could be, you know, in today's Hollywood, a, a, a really good one. Man, I hope so. Um, I can uh, I can report uh, this is a, a world exclusive. Uh, we uh, we just sold the rights uh, uh, for a movie based on the book uh, last week um, to a couple of brothers who are actors in uh, uh, Los Angeles who are originally from Pittsburgh and uh, and knew the story very well. Um, Sony Pictures had bought the rights and. Uh, and uh, held the rights for five or six years, um, but you know it's so many, so many stories get bought in in Hollywood, and uh, and uh, so few movies ever end actually end up getting made. I think it would be a fantastic movie. Uh, myself, obviously, I'm a little biased, um, but uh, but I think it would be a great movie. You know, the movie Leatherheads came out. Um, probably now eight or nine years ago. And I guess that didn't do so well. So that's set the football movies back a little bit. Um, but um, I, I really think uh, not just for the story of the Steagles, but like I talked about earlier, the story of life on the home front. Um, you know, I, when I interviewed the players, I also interviewed their wives, um, uh, you know, who were surviving at the time. And uh, uh, the stories they told were fascinating about uh, trying to find shoes for their kids and uh, trading ration stamps, which was actually prohibited. It was illegal, but everybody did it because the, the family that had uh, six kids always needed shoes. And uh, the family that only had one kid across the street could afford to, uh, you know, to give their uh, their shoe ration coupons away. Um, so it, it's not just a football story. I think it's it's a it's a bigger story than that. And uh, um, I'd love to see it be made into a movie. I think it'd be really cool. Well, congratulations. And of course, talk about burying the lead. Um, that's a amazing uh, uh, piece of information. You have any idea <laughs> as to and we know how slowly and torturously uh, Hollywood can be with these kinds of projects. Do you have any sense of, of how this may be developed and when and timing? No, I, I don't. Um, I'm I, I'm really hopeful, though, that, uh, you know, when 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 Sony bought the rights, I was very excited because uh, I thought, well, Sony, geez. And then I kind of learned that, uh, you know, what a big studio like that does is buys uh, a thousand stories a year and one of them gets made into a movie, that kind of thing. And I think uh, the uh, the guys who are interested in it now are real uh, uh football fans, real Steelers fans in particular. And I think they really like the story. So I'm really hopeful that something, you know, even in the next year or two, uh, will happen in terms of, uh, of them, uh, finishing a script and, uh, and, and being able to shop it around. Um, I, uh, I certainly did not get into uh, writing a book about the Steagles to uh, get rich, and it's a good thing because uh, I have not. <laughs> and I'm finding out that uh, uh, this little uh, this little uh, story of professional uh, football history has uh, uh, a f fairly fairly narrow appeal. But uh, if I think if people really see the bigger story, um, they would really enjoy it. And I have to say, uh, getting to know, uh, there's an organization called uh, Professional Football Researchers Association, PFRA. And uh, these are the guys who are like Sabre, you know, Sabre for uh, baseball. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're the Sabre guys for football. And uh, they, they do an amazing job and talk about a labor of love. I mean, going back through box scores from the 20s and 30s. And there's so much in NFL history we don't even know. I mean, there's, there's uh, you know, in the early days of the NFL, going back to the 20s, I mean, teams just scheduled games wherever and whenever they could. Um, even in 1943, the, the week before the Packers played the Steagles at Shide Park, the, the Packers played an exhibition game against a semi-pro team. I mean, there, there were games going on that, that they still aren't even sure you know, where they were played or who won. And uh, that's what these guys uh, in the Professional Football Researchers Association do. And so uh, um, it, they were they were really helpful. And the Hall of Fame was really helpful, too. It was really it was really cool to go to the Pro Football Hall of Fame and look back at the meeting minutes for the NFL owners meetings from the 1940s 
and uh, and just read through those. It was uh, it was it was really fun researching. Well, I, I hopefully you will invite uh, all of those folks as well as yours truly uh, for the red carpet <laughs> premiere because uh, we I, 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 again I agree I think it would be it's a tremendous story writ large beyond just sort of the narrow um, fan uh, fandom of of pro football history. Um, w- one last thing I'll, I'll only throw out there, um, and maybe I, I I sort of put this as a postscript, but um, it seems to me that uh, after the end of the uh, the forty three season. Uh, and, and the war and the drafting process seemed to be somewhat stabilizing, at least uh, in terms of how the home front was going to uh, prepare and, and help uh, uh, support the war effort. Um, mm-hmm. it, it didn't stop, apparently, uh, the uh, uh, other teams from merging as well in, in a subsequent year. Um, and, and maybe you can sort of explain 1944 and, and a, shall we call them, less successful merged, uh, merged team <laughs> Uh, that kind of uh, uh, followed in their footsteps, no? Yeah. Um, so after the 43 season, uh, uh, the Eagles owner, Lex Thompson, decided to uh, uh, go go uh, his own way again in 1944. As I mentioned, Lex was a real sensitive to branding and marketing, and uh, he had never been a big fan of the merger. And so after the 43 season, uh, the Steelers were still in desperate need of players, the Eagles uh, declined to merge with them again, and so the uh, Steelers had to find another partner to merge with in 1944, and they merged with the Chicago Cardinals. And uh, that team was known rather um, – uh, it's not very poetic, no, I guess. Not- Card Pit. <laughs> Card Pit was the name of the team. And uh, they managed to go 0-10 and are widely acknowledged as one of the worst teams in NFL history. I think a couple of the players were fined for, quote, indifference in 1944. And uh, Card Pit uh, actually has come to be known as uh, the Carpets because everybody walked all over them. So it was not a very successful merger in uh, in 1944 for uh, Art Rooney and Burt Bell. Uh, but again, it was important in uh, important to uh, to keep the league alive. And, uh, you know, my my own personal daydream, of course, is that someday there will be a uh, Steelers Eagles Super Bowl. And, uh, of course, uh, my book will be featured prominently at halftime. Uh, but uh, as close as I've, I've come to this daydream is the uh, Steelers Cardinals uh, uh, Super Bowl. Uh, a few years ago, uh, and there were a couple articles about Card Pit uh, in the papers uh, when the uh, Steelers and the Cardinals uh, met in the Super Bowl, but uh, still waiting for that Steelers-Eagles Super Bowl. Well, uh, I, it, it, perhaps that happens before the movie, or maybe the movie happens before that, or perhaps they happen during <laughs> the same year. Wouldn't that be interesting? Um uh, so before we wrap up, uh, I do want to thank you again from um, from uh, all the way from Mozambique to uh, to to be with us on this. Um, you want to give us some My pleasure. some sense of what um, you're currently working on uh, outside of this uh, of this sort of reminiscence and, and book from the past. Um, what other things uh, do you keep you busy and and what might you be doing when you come back in the states? Are you authoring other other works? Do you have other other interests? Yeah. Um, uh, actually, I have a book coming out. Uh, it, it came out a couple of years ago, but it's coming out in paperback uh, this fall. And it's a book that I uh, kind of discovered while I was doing the research for the Steagles book. And I was doing research into the history of spectator sports in the United States. And uh, and while I was doing that, I came across a sport called pedestrianism, uh, which was very popular in the 1870s and 1880s. And these were long distance walking matches. And uh, the most popular version of this sport was the six day walking match. Uh, uh, you couldn't uh, play sports or do any kind of amusements on Sundays at the time because of the Sabbath. And so uh, these walking matches would take place inside arenas. They begin right after midnight, Sunday night, Monday morning, and they continue right up to midnight the following Saturday night. And uh, whoever walked the most miles in six days was the winner. And so they'd put a little dirt floor, a uh, dirt track, maybe a sixth of a mile around on the on the floor of Ma- Madison Square Garden, for example. And these guys would walk in circles for six days and 
10,000 people a night would come out to just watch them walk in circles. And the winner might do uh, five or 600 miles in a week. And uh, the uh, the payouts were huge. These guys would uh, take home $20,000, uh, you know, back in uh, 1880. This is kind of it's the equivalent of a half million dollars for a week's worth worth of work. And so um, uh, pedestrianism is kind of uh, uh, kind of where my mind is at right now. And um, I'm also thinking about doing another book uh, uh, for my next book. Um, uh, it's about the uh, uh, around the world flight that Wiley Post did. Do you know who Wiley Post was? I do not. He was the guy who was piloting the the, the plane that uh, crashed with uh, Will Rogers in 1935. So Wiley Post was a uh, was a very famous pilot in the 30s, and he was the first pilot to fly around the world. Uh, he did it in eight days and uh, was really as, as famous as Lindbergh in his day. But uh, unfortunately, he died uh, in the crash with uh, Will Rogers in 1935. And so um, uh, I think it'd be cool to do a story about this uh, around the world flight in 1931. And so he flew uh, from New York to London to Berlin to Moscow. So he's really visiting some interesting places for 1931. And uh, it would be a good excuse for me to take a tax deductible trip around the world, too. I think that's an awesome idea. <laughs> I, I also want to tell our listeners before we let Matthew go that um, we uh, in, in the preparation for this uh, conversation, we bonded over our uh, our interest in the old uh, North American Soccer League and uh, the lamentable, I guess, to some extent, Philadelphia Fury in the late 70s um, and uh, shared a couple of videos and stuff. So I, 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 I guess there's no real story there to be to be had in terms of a book. But um, uh, I do reserve the right to uh, send you YouTube videos as I come across them uh, along I, the line. I would uh, actually I think, uh, well, I just read uh What's the, uh, is it called rock and roll soccer? Yeah, Ian, uh, Ian yeah. Pundalith is, he's certainly somebody on my list uh, to pursue as we get going. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was a really good book. I think uh, the Fury would be a great team uh, to focus on just because of the whole aspect of the ownership group. And uh, and uh, I, uh, I have to say I was 12 years old in 1978 and I've, I was a huge soccer fan. Um, you know, everybody thought soccer was going to be the sport of the 80s. And I... I have to say I was a I was a big Phillies fan and uh, I would send I remember sending a baseball card to Mike Schmidt to have him see if he to have him sign it and mail it back. And of course, I never saw the card again. Um, but I, I also sent a letter to uh, Tony Glavin, who was uh, sure, the uh, on the, the pocket Fury, rocket, the pocket rocket. And uh, I got back and I still have it, a two page handwritten note from Tony Glavin and just thanking me for my interest. And if, if I come to a game, let him know. And he'd like to meet me. And now Tony is a Facebook friend of mine. He's in St. Louis. He, he, he runs soccer academies out there. And uh, there were just aspects of uh, the end uh, of the fury that like that, that I just I just loved. I mean, um, I thought that was so cool. I'll always be a, a Philadelphia Fury fan. I'd love to get one of those uniforms, man. They were just beautiful. Well, we have... Um uh, a couple of guests coming up from uh, uh, NASL land um, with uh, hopefully some some great stories. Bobby Moffat, uh, former Dallas Tornado player for about seven, eight years, mm -hmm. uh, is in the midst of writing a book as well. Should be uh, coming out in a couple of months and, and we're going to be talking with him on some of these issues. So um, more to come. And I'm, I'm happy to share some further notes with you as we move along. But um, in the meantime, who, uh, who was who, yeah. who owned uh, who owned a. Uh, the tornado was that uh so the tornado uh, yeah the tornado were uh was owned uh uh by the um the duo of lamar hunt right who obviously has yes. afl football dalliances uh and arguably mm -hmm. was the savior of not only um the afl and its ultimate merger but the nasl and obviously the pro it's it's uh, subsequent mls um, uh, progeny but uh, also a guy named bill mcnutt who from what I understand, was a fruitcake baron. There was such a thing. He was the king of the fruitcakes, not personally, really? but in terms of his business line. And um, the huh. two of them uh, managed that team uh, through the late 60s all the way until the, the early 80s. So it was probably the most one of the most legacy uh, teams of, of that league and stable. Yeah. And, and obviously the the iron hand of, of Lamar Hunt uh, being largely the reason. So. You know, Bobby's going to be somebody who's going to be very uh, uh, interested in, in 
and, and helpful. And, and I think he too likes to uh, regale in some stories in, in the old league. Uh, and I'm looking forward to talking to him. And he's, he's quite the spirited character. So I think uh, the uh, Adams, who were the Fury's predecessors uh, in 73, I think it was the tornado that the Adams beat to win the uh, league championship at Texas Stadium. You were correct, sir. And it was also yeah. on the front yeah. cover of uh, Sports Illustrated uh, that week. Yeah, as well. Bob Rigby. Thank you, Matthew. I want to. I can't thank you enough. Good stuff. Thank you. Same. And thank you, Matthew. Bye bye. Thanks. Okay, well, that was cool. A little extra bonus material there. A little Philadelphia Fury, NASL soccer. Always welcome on this podcast. And uh, who knew that uh, Matthew and I shared that sort of NASL uh, trivia past there. So there you go. A little treat there for our soccer fans out there listening. But also, you know, talk about burying the lead. You know, this story, we just broke the news here on this podcast that the story that Matthew's written about the Steagles is uh, been picked up by uh, a studio in Hollywood and hopefully will be made into a motion picture, hopefully sooner rather than later. We'll definitely keep in touch with him as uh, as the weeks and months progress and, and, and keep our fingers crossed that a quality movie uh, that tells the story with authenticity does result. And uh, congratulations to him on, on getting that story at least sold and into the process. And we keep our fingers crossed that uh, the movie comes out uh, soon. In the meantime, the book uh, that you can get out there wherever good books are sold uh, is called Last Team Standing, How the Steelers and the Eagles, the Steagles, Saved Pro Football During World War II. You can also get uh, the book not only wherever good books are sold, you can find a link to it uh, on our website, goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, and you can also go to Matthew's website, which is Matt Algeo, which is M-A-T-T, Algeo, A-L-G-E-O, all one word, mattalgeo.com, and also see uh, his other works as well. Thank you. Uh, tremendous input from uh, our listeners so far. I am amazed at how many people have been uh, touched or influenced by our, our conversations thus far, and we have so much more to come. Uh, and I thank you kindly. We look forward to uh, your listening to us in the near future. Till then, take care. Thanks. Thanks.